The hand plane. This is a very beautiful, simple tool. When I first started to use one of these, I was very apprehensive as to how accurately you could take shavings. I would machine up a piece of wood and plane a face side and a face edge on it. The face edge would be planed on the surface planer using the the fence to get it nice and square and true and I was initially of the opinion that you shouldn't mess with that board it's been done by a machine and it's perfectly accurate there is no way you will be able to get it more accurate by putting one of these onto it after a while of using one of these I realized that really when you take the board off the machine it's close but it's not accurate for edge jointing, it needs to be much more cleanly planed and all of the little ins and outs that come from the machine can be trued up very quickly and accurately by using a hand plane. So, in making fine furniture, this tool is very important. This piece of steel on the top here is called the cap iron. Usually they're a spring-loaded lever cap. This one on the number seven jointer has a screw. So you just loosen that and take that off. That's the cap iron. Then we have the blade. Well, it's a little bit stiff there. The blade and the chip breaker. The chip breaker sits on top of the blade and for fine shavings we like to have that chip breaker down as close as we can to the edge to strengthen and protect that edge. I use the cap iron just to help remove that, pop it in the screw, slide it off. So there's the chip breaker, we've already done some work on that. And then in the plane itself, what we're mainly concerned about in truing this up and getting it to work correctly is that all of the mating surfaces sit truly. There's no vibration, there's no chatter, and everything works sweetly. So we need the top surface of the frog, which is this main piece of steel in here. We need the top surface of the frog to be very smooth so that the chip breaker and blade together can slide up and down easily and enable us to retract the blade and set the blade. We need the mating surfaces of the frog to sit truly, so there's no vibration and chatter. And we need the sole of the plane to be very flat. And this is what we're going to be doing right now. The frog is held into the body of the plane with two screws. We're going to mark the location of the heads of those screws with a black texture so that we know roughly the torque that the manufacturer has applied. If the mating surfaces are out of whack, we may need to take a, a little bit off with some wet and dry sandpaper or a file, but it's important that when we set the frog back into the body of the plane that we try and get the same torque on those screws as best we can. If we over tighten, we may distort the sole of the plane and we really don't want that to happen. The frog is held into the sole of the plane by these two screws that you can see beneath my finger. To enable me to reset these screws at exactly the same spot is I'm going to put a pencil, a texture mark where the thread of the screw is so that I can retighten to exactly the same spot.
I've just popped the plane in the vise here. If we clamp it too tightly in the wrong place, we might do some damage to it. You'll notice down the front of the plane, there's a crosswed piece of steel. Uh, that's where I'm taking all of the clamping pressure because it's supporting both sides of the plane. Okay, this is the cross web piece of steel right here and you will see that that is taking all of the pressure in the vise. These are the two frog screws right here. These are the ones that we've marked. So they're quite tight and I'm just going to take these out. so that we can begin working on the frog and having a look. Okay. So this is the frog. Why it's called a frog, I have no idea. I've tried to find out, but I've been unsuccessful. So as I mentioned before, we're concerned about the top surface of the frog being flat and smooth so that the blade and the chip breaker can slide up and down. And we're concerned about the bottom mating surfaces, that is the surfaces on the frog that sit into the sole of the plane. First of all, it's helpful to run your fingers and have a really good look at those mating surfaces because sometimes there might be a raised piece of steel that prevents it from sitting snugly. I've run my fingers over these and there really isn't any pronounced raised pieces of steel. And what we're going to do to help us have a look at how the frog sits into the plane, we're going to apply some black texture and then pop it on there and just move it around a little bit to see how that fit is. But before we do that, I just want to place it in there where it was and just give it a bit of a wiggle and just see if it's sitting flat, see if there's any movement. So there it is, it's sitting there. There's if you can hear that, there is a little bit of rock and I would say that it's just because of the very rough machine finish on these mating surfaces. The black texture will show us. When you first take the frog out of the hand plane, the mating surfaces may be covered in some grease or lacquer to prevent them from rusting. You just need to remove that with some fine wire wool this is 4-0 wire wool that I'm just going to use to rub on those mating surfaces to get rid of any of that grease or lack of that maybe there. I'm going to do the same on the mating surfaces in the sole of the plane. Now I'm going to cover them with texture. Just a black ink permanent marker job and down there so now it's black I'm going to do the same on the inside mating surfaces in the plane This will just help give me a really good idea of how sweetly the frog sits into the plane. Okay, both of those surfaces are coated. The black texture helps you to see just how rough the machined surface is there. We don't have to remove very much steel though to get a nice smooth surface that will enable the frog to sit firmly into the sole of the plane. By the way, this screw where my finger is here is the frog adjusting screw. When we reset the frog into the sole of the plane, before we tighten the two screws that hold the frog into the body, 
we will use this frog adjusting screw to make sure that the, the mouth opening where the chip breaker and blade slide down is nice and tight. Now comes the part where we're going to true up these mating surfaces. There are a number of different ways that you can true these up and smooth them off and flatten them. What we're mainly concerned with is ensuring that we're not messing with these levels. We're not curving things over and we're not disturbing the trueness of these mating surfaces. You can create jigs to help you. What I'm going to do is place the frog in a vise and using a file and some 400 grit wet and dry sandpaper, I am going to very carefully shave these back. Here is the frog set up in the vise. First of all, I'm going to concentrate on these two front edges and then I'm going to concentrate on these two back edges. I have a file and all I'm doing is I have a thin strip of 400 wet and dry sandpaper and I'm just going to place that under the file and keep it nice and flat. And I'm going to place that on top and I'm going to feel the angle and the flatness and I'm just going to carefully draw that on and off a couple of times and then have a look. I'm going to place it back on there. Feel the, make sure it's nice and flat. And have a look. You can see where the 400 grit wet and dry has removed the black texture and it's showing the machine ridges in the seating of the frog. We're going to continue until we clean these up. There really isn't much steel to remove, but we want these to be nice and clean. So I'm going to place the file and the sandpaper back on. Feel it flat. Just keep looking at it, take it off and have a look at it frequently to make sure you're not doing any damage. You can see the high spots, you can see the low spots. If you're not comfortable doing it freehand, you can make yourself a jig. It really doesn't take much, much time. If you find that it is taking you quite a considerable amount of time, you might even consider using a coarser grit sandpaper, maybe a, a 240. It's looking better already looking much better. You have to 
be very careful not to rock. You don't want to create bevels on the frog seating because you'll make it worse. After three or four minutes of sanding with the 400 grit and the file, you can see the marked improvement in the mating surfaces on that frog. I've noticed that it's a little bit raggedy along this leading edge here, and I'm just going to use the file just to take off those sharp edges. Turn the frog around so that I'm not in the way. I'm just going to use the file just to take off those sharp edges. Just needs a gentle run like that. That's perfect. Now I've popped the frog back into the vise and I'm going to use the file and the sandpaper to concentrate on this mating surface right here. I'm going to use the same procedure as I used on the top ones. So once again I'm just going to be very careful because I do not want to rock this. So feel the level. In doing both mating surfaces, this one and this one, I really haven't spent any more than three or four minutes on each. It doesn't take that long. You're only looking to remove 80 to 100 percent of the coarse manufacturer's scratches and you will greatly improve the fit. All we're looking to achieve is to have no rock or vibration, that the mating surfaces are predominantly sound. So there you go. You can still see the, some coarse manufacturer's scratches, but I'm really happy with these. If after I've also sanded and filed the mating surfaces in the body of the plane, there is still a rock, I will have another look and I may need to take, take them down a little bit further. But I don't want to take too much off. So I'm really happy with the way these are at the moment. And now we're going to do the same on the mating surfaces in the body of the plane. Now we're going to concentrate on cleaning up these two mating surfaces in the plane body, here and here. Now in order for me to do these, I'm going to remove the frog adjusting screw and the handle. So the handle has two screws. It's quite easy to remove them. You just undo the screws. Do it carefully because I don't want to roll the edges of the heads. This one screws onto a thread, a threaded rod. And we'll just take out this threaded rod. Now I can remove the frog adjusting screw and it just means that I've got room to move 
which is important. Getting into accurately file or sand these down is quite difficult. There's not much room to move. As a result, there's a danger that we might rock these surfaces. We don't want to do that. We want to keep them perfectly flat. I'm going to use a, a block of MDF to help me achieve this. I've cut this and I've checked it for square. I want to make sure that it's flat and true and square and it is and I'm going to start with some 240 grit sandpaper because these two are quite rough and all I'm going to do is place it over the block keep it flat curl it up each side so I can really get a good grip of it and I'm going to run it backwards and forwards like this, keeping it level. I've just popped this in the vise so I can show you exactly what I'm going to be doing. But whilst I'm doing it, I'm actually going to have it flat on the bench. It will be easier for me to ensure I'm doing it accurately. I have the block with the sandpaper and all I'm going to be doing is placing it over like this, making sure that I don't rock, rock it backwards and forwards, that I get the level right and I'm going to move this backwards and forwards like that and rub. I'm going to place that on to the mating surfaces and I'm just going to feel the level. By rocking it from side to side, you can feel where the level is. Now, it's 240 grit and the range of movement is very slight. Once you've done a bit, you can take it off and you will be able to see where the high points are. By doing it crossways like this, I feel that I have a much better chance of keeping these flat and accurate. If I was going backwards and forwards along the front to the back and back to the front, I feel that there might be more tendency for me to rock this. That's why I'm choosing to go from side to side. After that 15 seconds worth of rubbing with the sandpaper, the 240 grit, you are able to see the polished high surfaces. It's very apparent there where it's high and where it's low. There's not a great deal to, to remove and I don't think it's going to take very long. Feel the balance, feel the level. If you run your fingers over them, you will be able to feel the ridges. Just going to move that along to some fresh paper. So the dark areas are where the texture still remains, they're the low points. The polished surfaces that you can see, the polished areas, are the high points that are being worn down. What we might do now though, is just place the frog on and see if that rock that was there at the start has been reduced. There's still a little rock but it's greatly reduced. That's good. 
I've just cut myself a, a clean strip of sandpaper and now we'll go again. Still on 240. I can feel that that ridge is reducing. So that's what those mating surfaces look like now after no more than five minutes of work. You can still see the very tiny little dark ridge through the centre of that one, but because it's in the centre and all, of it, all around it is flat, I'm not concerned about it. I don't want to take any more off those, they're greatly improved. The mating surfaces in the sole of the plane are about 9mm wide. This piece of MDF that I was using to sand them is 18mm. So I was able to cover the whole width. It was lengthwise, that lengthwise of the mating surfaces that I was going backwards and forwards. The Internal width of the plane is 65mm and the width of this piece here is 52 So it was just a small amount that wasn't covered. That's the size of that MDF block that I was using. Now I'm going to just pop the frog back into the body of the plane and just see how it feels. I can, I can feel just by popping it in and moving it that there's virtually no rot there now. So it's, it's really good. A little bit of work has greatly improved the seating and the mating surfaces. Before we place this frog back in, really, we also want to make, so, make sure that this top surface is smooth and flat, as I mentioned earlier. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to remove this brass adjusting wheel and this wire lever will just fall away from it. So I'm just going to wind that right out so that it, there you go, and take it right off so it's completely out of the way. And you can see that the wire adjustment lever there has just fallen away and that enables it to fall back so that that surface is free and I'm going to remove this screw that holds the blade and chip breaker in place. Let's just put a square on that to see how flat that is. It's quite good across there. end up there. I'm pretty sure that you would generally find that the top surface of the frog should be quite flat. If you found that it wasn't, you may need to take this lateral adjusting knob off so that you could then flatten it using either a Japanese water stone or a piece of wet and dry on some float glass. This one is quite flat so I'm really not going to mess with it. All I'm going to do is give it a rub down with some metal polish and wire wool just to make sure that it's nice and smooth. And that is all I'm going to do to the top surface. So I'm just going to get some metal polish all over those steel surfaces and then I'm just going to rub it in. I want to be able to retract the blade and then wind it out very easily. I don't want it to get caught on nicks or bits of steel. If you had any sharp, sharp pieces of steel protruding, you could also just use a file. Just going to clean that up. 
make sure there's no metal bits floating around. So I'm just going to pop that screw back in and I'm going to pop this back, this brass adjusting wheel back on. When you wind it on, when you get to a certain point, just make sure that the the wire rod just drops down, there you go, so it's cool, and you're back in business. Lovely. So the frog is looking good. Before we set the frog back into the plane, there's one final job I would like to do, and it's just on the mouth of the plane. Once we've done that, we can set the frog in, we're also going to put a chip breaker and blade together and set that onto the frog so that we can set the mouth at just the right width opening. Then we will fix the frog in place and then flatten the sole. Once this plane is, is in beautiful working order, it's going to be used to take fine finishing shavings. So, I want the shavings to be able to roll out nice and smoothly out of the mouth of the plane. I'm going to pop this back in the vise and try and zoom in on the front of the mouth to just show you because it's quite rough and it's square to the sole. We're going to plane it back slightly just to increase that opening, not the size of the opening, but we're just going to angle it back so that it's got more room for the shavings to flow out. What I'm talking about is this front opening here, where the end of the screwdriver is. It's currently square to the sole. We're going to angle it back towards this front edge slightly so that there's more room for the shavings to flow out. We'll also clean it up and make sure that there's no raggedy bits of steel or sharp edges that will cause the shavings to catch. My aim here is to just file the inside front edge of the mouth opening. I want to smooth it off and just have it tapering back towards the front so that the gap for the opening for the shavings to roll out is slightly larger. I don't want any shavings to be trapped in there. I have the plane set in the vise at a small angle and I'm going to try and keep the file horizontal. I do not want to increase the size of the opening. I'm not going to touch the opening of the mouth as it touches the sole of the plane. I'm only touching the opening on the top surface. The front edge of the inside opening of the mouth is quite rough and this is smoothing it up very nicely. Just use your brush to clean. 
clean it away, I can see exactly where I'm removing steel, making sure that I'm not touching the mouth at the sole side because I don't want to increase the size of the opening. What I have done just then is I have slightly angled back towards the top this front opening and that will enable the shavings to flow out very smoothly and not get caught. It's just increasing that opening on the inside of the plane, not on the underside where the sole is. We didn't want to increase that opening. You can see a little bit of rubbish along this end here. I'm just going to take that off quickly with the file and clean that up. And now we are going to set the frog in the plane and place the blade and chip breaker on the frog and set the mouth opening so it's nice and fine to enable us to take fine shavings. Then using the frog adjusting screw and the frog setting screws, we'll set the frog in place. Then we can get on to flattening the sole. Now we come to the part where we set the frog in the plane body and secure its position. We want the mouth opening to be reasonably small to enable us to take fine shavings. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to put a blade and chip breaker together. So I'll do that quickly. I'm going to have the end of the chip breaker about half a mil away from the end of the blade. This will give the blade a lot of support Okay, before I place the frog back into the body, I'm actually just going to remove the handle again. It enables me to really come front on to the frog adjusting screw instead of trying to come at it at an angle, which is very difficult. So I'm going to remove the handle so that I can set the frog. Okay, so the positioning of the frog in the plane body has, is determined on quite a few variables. First of all, we're going to place the frog back into the body of the plane, making sure that that little groove that you can see on the underside of the frog slots in to the frog adjusting screw. That will enable you to move the frog backwards and forwards. Okay. So that's in there. Now, I'm just going to pop the two screws that hold the frog into the plane body back in. Now, I'm not going to tighten them up fully because we may need to adjust this. These are these two screws that we took out and marked the, the torque position on the frog. So I'm just going to pop them in, but I'm not going to tighten them up fully. I just want them to hold the frog down. That's the first one. So I've just popped them in and I don't want them too tight. Now because we want the opening where the shaving is coming through to be reasonably small, and when I say reasonably small, I'm thinking about a millimetre. How far the blade and chip breaker need to be wound down to protrude out of the mouth also has a bearing on the placement of the frog. So that's why, to start with, we're just going to hold this. I want to get the frog centred. And now I will just 
not tighten them fully, but just have them pinch so that the frog won't move. Now I'm going to place the blade and the chip breaker into the plane and sit them on the frog. Okay. Now, by doing that, I can now just hold that in place, turn the plane over and have a look and see how far away I am from having the blade protrude. And it's quite close. It just needs to be wound out a fraction and it will be protruding. And the gap between the front of the mouth and the blade will be about a millimetre. I'm happy with that. If you're not happy with the positioning of the frog, it is this screw down under here which enables you to wind the frog in and out to suit the setting that you want. The part that I find the trickiest when finding the perfect placement for the frog is ensuring that the blade is parallel to the front of the mouth. So I just use a blade without the chip breaker attached and I just place it on the frog bevel down as normal and I just wiggle the frog until I get the blade parallel to the front of the mouth. Then the tricky bit is without moving the frog you need to take the blade off and then fix it in place. This may take several goes because it's a little bit of a tricky finicky job. Tighten the screws up a little bit, pop the blade back in, see if you've got it. Uh, I haven't. I've moved that frog slightly, so I'll have another go. Just move that then. It's tricky. This can take quite a few goes, but just persevere and you will get it. But you have to have that blade parallel to the front of the mouth. I think I've got it. That looks good. Okay. Now we're ready to flatten the sole. So I'm going to reassemble the blade and chip breaker because I want this plane to be set up as if I were using it when I flatten the sole. So we'll put the blade and the chip breaker together. I will set them in the plane and just retract the blade so that I can flatten the sole. Pop it in. Make sure it's centered. Pop the cap iron on. Tighten it down. And now I'm going to wind it back into the body of the plane. So it's well out of the way.
Okay, now we're ready to start flattening the sole. We now come to flattening the sole of the plane. Now I've put a straight edge on this because I need to determine how flat it is at the moment because its degree of flatness presently will determine the starting grip of the sandpaper that I will be using to flatten it. And it's not too bad. It's touching at both ends and it's not quite touching at the front and the back of the mouth. Now the four points that I need to be perfectly flat and in line for this plane to work properly are the front, the back and either side of the mouth. If it's slightly concave along here, I'm not concerned about that. It's not going to affect the accurate use of the plane. So what I'm going to do to help me determine when this is flat is I'm going to put some texture marks along it. Just like this, using the texture again. Either side of the mouth and just a few more along it. pop them in when I take it out of the vise. I might even run some down like that. So this plane, the sole of this plane, is not too far from being flat. If it was way out, I would probably maybe start sanding it with 60 grit sandpaper or maybe even 80. Because it's not too far off, I'm going to try and start with 120 this time. Now, in flattening the sole, I need the surface that I'm using to flatten the sole, obviously, to be very flat. In the past, I have used the surface benches of my machine planer. But today I'm going to use a large 12mm thick piece of float glass. Okay, I'm going to start with some 80 grit wet and dry sandpaper that I have held to the plate glass just with the surface tension of water. That's fine. And we will see how we go. lift it up and have a look. When we initially checked it with the straight edge we could see that it was it was touching at the front and the back and the removal of the texture confirms that they were touching. We knew that it was also low around the mouth and slightly concave through here which it's telling us as well. I can also see that fresh steel is coming up around the mouth. This is good because we need the front, the back, and just around the mouth to be flat and perfectly in line. So we're going to keep on going. This is looking good. Have another look. Ooh. I can see nice, nice fresh steel around the mouth. So we're greatly improving this plane, and I'm going to be excited about using it.
still a fair bit to come. tiring on your arms. Get rid of that steel that's caught in there. You can see how flattening the plane when you have it in its working order is the best way to go because all of the pieces are in place. I'm going to place some more texture on this because it's all most of it's been removed. Okay, let's get the lactic acid working. Okay, there's still texture mark around the mouth. Now basically, I'm going to keep doing this until I am very happy that I've got this flat where it needs to be flat. Once I've done that, I will move up to 120 grit, then 180, and then 240, and finally I will just polish it on 400, yeah? Once you've got it flat with the coarser grits, you don't need to spend a lot of time on the finer grits because it's already flat. You're basically just using them to polish the steel so it hasn't got a coarse rough finish from a coarse sandpaper. I have just spent the last 45 minutes working the sole of this plane. I've spent 40 minutes on 80 grit wet and dry I used two pieces each for 20 minutes and I've just spent the last five minutes on 120 and this is how it's looking. I have a little bit of texture, a faint bit of texture in the middle here where it's concave. I'm not worried about it. I'm not going to spend any more time flattening this to remove that texture because that little bit of concaveness there won't affect the performance of the plane. There is one thing that I forgot to mention earlier. Before I actually started sanding this on the float glass, I just used some acetone and wire wool to just remove the very thin coat of lacquer that comes when you buy a brand new plane to stop it rusting. I now have some 240 grit I've, I've skipped 180 and I've gone straight to 240. Now I have a fresh piece of 240 which I'm going to use to polish the sole of the plane. It's already flat. So I'm going to do this only to remove the 120 scratches.
I've also just very briefly done the sides just to clean them up. I'm not too concerned about actually making them perfectly square with the sole because when I am using the plane on its sides for shooting, if there's a small error, I can easily rectify that by placing shims on the shooting board. This is soon to be a brand new tool and it will be working like one that would have cost me five times the price. The other good thing about actually working on tools is you get to know them, you get to know how they work and if there's a little problem with its performance you can work it out and fix it. Just going to do the sides. You can have a look to see how the removal of the scratches is progressing. Finally, to finish the polishing here, I'm using 400. Now I couldn't find any long thin strips of 400, so I have to be careful here. I've just, whoops, just spread out. some thin bits on the glass and I'm just going to rub it like this. The performance of the plane will improve with time. I'm also just going to just put a little bit of a chamfer on these sharp edges with some 400. It can't hurt. It's just going to take the crispness out of that edge. Okay, I think it's ready to put in a sharp blade and give it a go. Just wound it back in to take some finer shavings. It's cutting beautifully. That's a very wafer thin shaving. A through wafer thin shaving just floating out of the plane beautifully
I now have a brand new jointer number seven hand plane that will be a joy to use for decades. It cost me a fraction of the price of a far more expensive one and now it will do exactly the same job. The last thing I would like to cover is caring for your hand plane when it's not in use. I have a, a small tin box here. Inside the box is a piece of wood that fits snugly. It has a nice piece of felt or velvet that's wrapped around it, which sits a couple of mil proud of the sides. When this dries out, I spray some Japanese camellia oil on it to keep it moist. And when I've finished using my hand planes, my chisels, my squares, anything that might rust, all I do is run the sides over the cloth. It puts a thin coat of oil on the sides, run it along the base, exactly the same. Now, when I put this away, it's protected from rust. The next time I need it, I grab it, I wipe it down, it's rust free, it's ready to go. I really hope that today's DVD on preparing plane blades, sharpening plane blades, resharpening them, getting a curved blade, looking at the chip breaker and having an in-depth look at how we can turn a cheapish hand plane into a really wonderful, accurate, beautiful tool has been beneficial for you.